Thank you all for coming. I'm Laura Belback with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Dartmouth. So we are sponsoring this lecture, and Dartmouth Hitchcock has been kind enough to let us use the space. For those of you who don't know Osher, we are a nonprofit in Hanover that provide learning opportunities in the Upper Valley um, through courses and lectures. So we have fall term coming up with over 90 courses. We um, are lucky to have a lot of volunteers who provide their time and add an array of experience and knowledge to the courses, including Dr. Santulli. I actually first met Dr. Santulli when he taught an OSHA course on Richard Wagner, and um, it was very enjoyable. The opera music actually wafted into my office, making my Thursday afternoons wonderful. <laughs> so today, Dr. Santulli will be discussing an update on Alzheimer's disease, where we stand, and where we are headed. Dr. Santulli is an honorary associate professor of psychiatry at Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. He currently teaches courses on dementia and aging. Prior to his retirement from clinical practice, he was the director of the Dartmouth Memory Clinic here at DHMC. He's also an author of The Alzheimer's Family, Helping Caregivers Cope, and co-author of The Emotional Journey of the Alzheimer's Family. I'm very pleased to have Dr. Santulli back to speak with us today. And one other thing I was gonna mention, there's a walk to end Alzheimer's, and that's on Sunday, September 22nd. So registration is gonna be at 9 a.m., or you can register or donate online. So the pamphlets are down here, and if there's anyone that hasn't gotten handouts, they're down here as well for Dr. Santulli's presentation. With that, Dr. Santulli. Thank you very much, thank you, Laura. Um, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. I appreciate your interest and looking at the size of the crowd, it's clear that this is a topic that people are most most concerned about. And uh, I hope to give you a, a fairly br o uh, gross overview of the topic of Alzheimer's disease and talk a little bit about where we're headed. And the, the short answer to that is we're not sure, but I'll make sure we have lots of time at the end for questions. So uh, if, please feel free to ask those as we once we get done. And uh, Laura, I'm not going to play any music today, unfortunately, unless you happen to be a Wagner fan. But uh, I'll, uh, and I won't, uh, I definitely won't sing, but um, I hopefully will make this interesting and uh, uh, enlightening to you, for you. Okay, okay. The parking is unbelievable, apparently. And I certainly can, uh, I found that too when I came in, so it's, I, I can't understand why they can't have more spaces here, but that's another story. We won't get into that. Part of the reason there is so much interest in this is because Alzheimer's is a very common problem. Can, can, by the way, can people hear me okay? Uh, is the microphone working okay? You can hear me uh, well? Um, right now, louder. Right now, it's estimated, let me see if I can get this a little closer. It's estimated that there are n uh, nearly 6 million people, 5.8 million people in the U.S. who suffer from Alzheimer's disease. And in the world, uh, as a whole, probably 50 million people. And it's estimated that if we don't find a cure or a way to prevent this disease between now and the next 30 years, the middle of this century, we'll have not uh, 50 million people in the world, but 130 and maybe 14 million in the United States. So the numbers are going up very drastically uh, every day. And what's the reason for that? Is it because Alzheimer's is somehow catching and people are picking it up uh, more and more often? As far as we know, that is not the case. And we're pretty definite about that. The reason for the increase is simply because the world is getting older. The population is aging, both here in the US and in the developed world. And as you can see on this slide, in particularly uh, in areas of the world that are less developed. Uh, so while these, the increase that's projected in this country is enormous and is uh, very uh, concerning to us, it's uh, nothing compared to what can be anticipated in the rest of the world. As basic 
health issues have been dealt with, uh, issues of sanitation and uh, infectious disease and hygiene and so forth, have been dealt with in some of the developing nations. That's wonderful, and people are living longer. The problem of living longer is there's a greater chance that you have of getting Alzheimer's disease. Age is the greatest risk by far for developing Alzheimer's disease. If you look at this graph, you can see that at, at age 70, only about 5% of the population suffers from Alzheimer's disease. But, and uh, at 65, about 2%. And the graph might suggest that it doesn't happen before that. That is not true. It does happen to people who are in the be, uh, earlier than 65 age group, which is then called early onset Alzheimer's. Thankfully, it's very, very rare, but it is not unheard of by any means. And there may be uh, several hundred thousand in the United States currently who are suffering from early onset Alzheimer's disease. That can begin anywhere I've read about in the 30s. I've treated people in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s as well. As I say, thankfully, very rare on those early ages. But as the ages, uh, as, as people get older, the risk of developing Alzheimer's goes up and up. It doubles every uh, uh, five years or so. So as you can see, by age 85, about 40%, then it falls off a little bit. But by age 90, at least according to this estimate, which comes from the Mayo Clinic, which is a very reputable source of information about Alzheimer's, about 50% of people will meet criteria for Alzheimer's disease, half the population. That's a huge, huge number of people to have a, a, a serious chronic illness. I'd like to re em emphasize, however, that what that also means is that 50% of 90-year-olds do not have Alzheimer's disease. That, and we all know of, or we know personally, people who are in their 90s or more who are sharp as a tack. So this is not inevitable. Very common, yes, but not inevitable. Alzheimer's is a leading killer. It's now considered the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. And among those over 65, the third leading cause of death after cancer and heart disease. And it's the only cause of death that is increasing while these other illnesses, cancer, heart disease, and the other ones on the list, are going down thanks to better and better care, Alzheimer's is going up. So this is unfortunately likely to move beyond the third position to even higher. So this is something that is uh, uh, not only uh, a serious concern of late life, but is something associated with death uh, in a high percentage of people who are elderly in this country. Alzheimer's costs, financial costs, because I think the emotional costs are even more staggering, but the financial costs are indeed overwhelming. In the United States, it's estimated that there are, it, it costs nearly $300 billion annually to care for people with Alzheimer's disease. About two-thirds of that for Medicare and Medicaid, and about a third of that for coming out of people's pockets, or in some cases, private insurance, although a lot of it is paid for out of pocket because insurance doesn't cover it. By 2050, with the increase in the numbers, in today's dollars, that will be over a trillion dollars. So this is, this is something that is breaking the bank of our healthcare system and, and will certainly uh, make it very difficult for us to take care of people with other diseases if this continues unabated over these next decades. It's estimated by the Alzheimer's Association that the individual cost of Alzheimer's for a given person lifetime is about $350,000. This is one of the most expensive diseases, not only nationally and worldwide, but in, in the individual family. One of the most expensive, expensive diseases that we can have. 
So what causes Alzheimer's disease? The short answer to, the short answer to that is we don't know. There are lots of theories, but the reality is that we still do not know what the cause of this condition is. And you can understand that that is certainly a major impediment to our being able to develop effective treatments or prevention. It certainly is easier to uh, prevent something when you know what the actual cause is. There are theories about amyloid and tau and so forth, but what is the root cause is still something hotly debated and un not understood, despite the fact that there's a great deal of work going on, but much more is needed. This is a slide that is a, uh, an electro uh, not electron, a regular micrograph of uh, this, a thin slice of someone's brain after death who had Alzheimer's disease. And it shows, uh, and you can see the arrows that I have labeled there, very clearly, the two hallmarks, pathological hallmarks of this disease, which were actually discovered by Dr. Alzheimer over 100 years ago, the amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Amyloid plaques are an, uh, a accumulation of abnormal amyloid protein that accumulates in between cells in the brain and tends to choke up uh, the normal movement of nutrients and so forth in the brain and leads to, we believe, leads to brain cell death. Neurofibrillary tangles occur right inside the nucleus of brain cells and also uh, are thought to contribute to the death of nerve cells. So we know this much, and we know a lot more about the pathology, a lot more about what's going on in the brains of people who are uh, suffering from Alzheimer's disease, but whether the things we know about are the cause of the disease, which is what has been thought in many uh, areas, or are merely a secondary phenomenon where the root cause is yet to be determined, that's what science is still working on, trying to figure out. Now, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease similarly is something that is still somewhat uncertain. There is no single diagnostic test that proof positive will say whether someone has Alzheimer's disease or is going to get Alzheimer's disease or not. There are tests that are leading us in that direction, certain types of PET scans that measure amyloid and, and tau, those things you saw in that micrograph a little a while ago. There are things that measure that, but that is not a perfect correlation with the diagnosis. A blood test is being worked on that still isn't going to be around for a few years. It's in a pretty preliminary stage that will measure amyloid in the blood. But once again, the presence of amyloid, while very suggestive of Alzheimer's, is not definitive. There are people who have plenty of amyloid in their brains who don't have Alzheimer's, and seemingly vice versa. So this remains a conundrum that is very frustrating, and if we it would be something that we would really welcome to have a definitive test that we could give people, simple one, hopefully a blood test, that would say, yes, this is something that the individual has or is a very soon going to develop, or no. But, but we do not have that at the present time. More research is needed in these areas, clearly. Now let me talk a little bit about the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Perhaps I should say, uh, in preface to that, that uh, people often ask about this. Al Alzheimer's disease and dementia are not the same thing. Dementia is a broad category that includes a number of different illnesses, a handful that are fairly common, of which Alzheimer's is by far and away the most common, counting for 60 to 80 percent of all cases of dementia. But there are other causes of dementia as well. So that while if you have Alzheimer's, you do have dementia, 
If you have dementia, there's a very good chance you have Alzheimer's, but you could have a different type of dementia as well. Most of what we know, since the vast majority of people with dementia are people who have Alzheimer's, and most of the research has been done, has been done on Alzheimer's, most of what we know is about Alzheimer's, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Much of what I'm saying applies to other types of dementia, but not necessarily. So let me come back to talk about the symptoms of the disease. Everyone knows, I think, that Alzheimer's affects the memory. We uh, talk about it as a memory disorder. It's really much more than that, but that is certainly one of the hallmark symptoms. And it isn't that you don't remember what happened when you were young. You may remember what happened when you were young very well. You don't remember what happened yesterday. Short-term memory is what is most severely affected in Alzheimer's disease. Things that happened an hour ago, a day ago, a week, a month ago, those are the things that are most likely to be lost, whereas memories from a long time ago, at least until very late in the disease, those remain fairly well uh, in place. So recent memory impairment is one of the hallmark symptoms. Another symptom group that is extremely common, one of the reasons that people like myself and who are psychiatrists are involved in this, is because Alzheimer's disease very, very frequently involves a whole range of neuropsychiatric symptoms. The most common of which is actually apathy. People who are developing Alzheimer's disease seem to in many cases, most cases, but not all, Every, there's always exceptions, people who are developing the disease become apathetic, less involved in the world, in their lives. They become more content to just sit and do very little. For some people, that's not a big change of how they were, from how they were, but for others, it's a very dramatic change and very disturbing for families when that happens. Some studies have suggested actually that apathy is the first symptom that occurs in most cases of Alzheimer's disease, even before the early memory loss, but it's debatable and it varies from person to person, of course. But it is one of the early symptoms to be sure. And a whole host of other behavioral symptoms often occur not only early on, but really throughout the course of the disease, whether that's depression, anxiety, sleeplessness, often later in the disease, paranoia, hallucinations, agitation, a variety of behavioral symptoms that for some people who care for someone with Alzheimer's disease is often more troubling than the memory loss itself. Another category of symptoms that is an, an inevitable part of Alzheimer's disease is what is uh, listed here as difficulty performing tasks. So that early on in the disease, and this is a, Alzheimer's I should say, I'll say in a minute more about it, is a progressive illness. It starts out mild and gets worse over time. But early on, people have difficulty doing things that uh, they never had trouble with before. It might be balancing their checkbook or using the ATM or cooking or uh, shopping or uh, driving a car, a very big issue for people early in the disease where driving can be quite unsafe, uh, but individuals who have it tend not to recognize it and tend not to want to stop driving. So it can be a, a big problem not only for the individual but for public safety. As the disease progresses, more basic functions such as being able to utilize utensils, knowing which you do you use a fork to eat your soup or a spoon, being able to cut your meat, being able to uh, get yourself dressed, even late in the disease, being able to ambulate or walk can become impaired so that even, and uh, hygiene is another one that commonly later in the disease becomes impaired, the ability to wash yourself properly and take care of your bodily functions. All of these things obviously lead to a need for greater and greater assistance from others. So that Alzheimer's disease, and this is true of any dementia, but we're talking about Alzheimer's, is a disease not only of the individual, 
but it's something that affects at least one other person, and very often many other people in that individual's life, spouse, adult children, other family members. Many people tend to be involved and uh, affected by the disease, both because they're having to help and simply because they're being affected by the loss of personality and other factors that have been uh, uh, damaged by the Alzheimer's itself. And as I said, symptoms tend to worsen over time. So that while it begins very gradually, very mildly, um, to so mildly that it's almost impossible, I would say it is impossible, to tell when it exactly begins because it's so gradual. And it gradually progresses with or without treatment, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, over the course of, on average, about 10 years, from the time of diagnosis till the time of death, about a decade. There can be a great deal of variability in that from just a few years to cases of nearly 20 years people have suffered from Alzheimer's disease. But it is important to realize this is a chronic illness. This isn't something you have for a little while and then it goes away, it never goes away, or you have for a little while and then you die. Generally, you have it and it goes on and on and on for years. Now let me say a word about treatment. And what I have to say about treatment isn't uh, all that encouraging, I'm afraid. Uh, currently, there are five medicines that are typically used, commonly used, to treat Alzheimer's disease. Three of these are medicines that are called cholinesterase inhibitors, denepazil, rivastigmine, galantamine. One of them is a drug that is uh, an, what's called an NMDA receptor antagonist, that's memantine or nemenda. And then most recently introduced is a, simply a combination drug of Aricept, Anepazil, and Memantine, uh, that's called Namzeric, and that's a brand name drug that is rarely used because it's very expensive, and you can easily give these others, which are all generic now, uh, uh, in combination. Part of the reason they're all generic is because if you look at the dates after these medications, they're a long time ago. There has not been a new medication developed for Alzheimer's disease for 15 years, 2004 was when memantine came on the market. And as I say, uh, Namzarek is just a combination of memantine and denepazil, but a brand new medication, not for 15 years. 2004 is when the last new drug was approved by the FDA to treat this condition. And if you compare that to, hyper, to drugs for heart disease, drugs for cancer, drugs for uh, many other common diabetes, common conditions, there are new drugs coming out all the time. What we have, we've had for a long time, and that doesn't mean that it hasn't been actively uh, explored, but there have been many, many drug failures along the way. And it's been a too long a period since the last medication was uh, made available. That would be okay if these medicines work wonders. They don't. They're modest in their effect, at best. They, as I mentioned, Alzheimer's is a progressive illness. It gets worse over time. And at best, the medications given singly or sometimes one or two medications given together can slow down that progression of the disease modestly. For some people, that Slowing doesn't even seem apparent, and for other people, it clearly isn't happening. For some, they get a nice, robust slowing for a year or so. But everyone would agree, including the people who make these medicines, that these are merely Band-Aids, and we need something much more effective to treat this disease. There are many studies. There's over 100 compounds uh, for treating Alzheimer's disease that are currently being evaluated. And these come in many different categories, several of which I'll, I'll mention. 
One is a group of drugs that are working on amyloid. Remember I showed you that slide with those amyloid plaques. And for many years, scientists have been convinced that amyloid is the problem, and we only have to find a way to prevent its development or, br or break it down once, it's, once it has formed. Unfortunately, that has not proved to be useful. There are medicines that have been made that can actually eliminate amyloid plaques, but in doing so, does nothing to affect the Alzheimer's disease. So clearly, those plaque, treating those plaques is not treating the disease. There are other drugs that are being worked on to prevent the development of abnormal amyloid protein in the first place. Uh, there's been many, many failures in that area, some because the feeling is that they're not being given early enough. Others are fa have failed because while they may or may not be effective, they have some toxic side effects that cause them to the clinical trials to be given up and many others where they've gone on for years in trial and found that it just didn't work. It's to the point where some of the major drug companies have actually pulled away from investing in drugs for Alzheimer's research. And that's a very worrisome thing because we rely on the ph pharmaceutical industry to help innovate. That's uh, uh, the way new drugs are developed is through uh, largely through the pharmaceutical industry. The government has some impact on that, but it's largely the big bucks of the pharmaceutical industry. But several companies have decided in the wake of many recent failures that it's simply not a good business decision to invest for them hundreds of millions of dollars into something that doesn't turn out. So hopefully the other companies that are still in the field will remain there and will contribute to developing what will hopefully be an effective and safe medication. Other drugs aside uh, from targeting amyloid target the tau protein that I mentioned that's abnormal in Alzheimer's disease. Others target inflammation of the brain. The brain inflames in Alzheimer's disease and there, though there's debate about whether that's cause or effect, there's a number of clinical trials looking at trying to reduce that level of inflammation and a whole bunch of other things that are being worked on. These clinical trials take a very long time because it's not like you can give somebody a, a drug or an experimental drug and a week later figure out whether it worked or not. You have to give it to people for years and then evaluate whether it's making a difference. So these things go on for a very long time and are very, very expensive. So what can you do now in the face of this? this disease is increasing because we're all getting older and our ability to treat it is quite limited. This is, what can you do now? And this is where an ounce of prevention is truly worth a pound of cure, more than a pound of cure. And there's a few things I'm going to mention and talk about. The first, as you can see, is to simply stay physically well and uh, active and socially and mentally active as well. We'll talk about those things. Here are six ways, these are identified by the World Health Organization, to lower your risk for Alzheimer's disease. Now, we're talking about lowering your risk, so these are relative measures. We don't know anything that you can do to eliminate the risk, unfortunately. But even if there is a way to lower the risk, that seems worthwhile. And you'll also see that the things I'm about to mention are obviously good for you in a whole bunch of other ways. But they've certainly been proven effective in Alzheimer's disease. The first of these that I want to mention, because it's so important and so widespread, is treating high blood pressure. High blood pressure depends on your doctor may have his or her own uh, definition for that, but overall it is somewhere over 140 uh, milligram, millimeters of mercury uh, over 90 diastolic, uh, systolic over diastolic. It's been shown that people who have high blood pressure have a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. High blood pressure is bad for blood vessels, bad for your heart, and those factors are associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. 
other types of dementia as well, vascular dementia, for example. But Alzheimer's disease is increased, the risk of it is increased with high blood pressure. However, many studies have now shown that treating high blood pressure will dramatically reduce that risk down to the level of someone who doesn't have high blood pressure. But you have to be in treatment for it. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have your blood pressure reduced to a certain number. Although a study that was published this, just this summer, well, was presented at the uh, Alzheimer's in, uh, International Conference this summer, uh, showed that reducing systolic blood pressure from 140 millimeters of mercury down to 120 will reduce the risk of mild cognitive impairment by a considerable amount. Uh, mild cognitive impairment is not Alzheimer's, but it's often a precursor to Alzheimer's, a milder form of cognitive impairment. So these are things that you ought to do anyway because of a whole host of other medical problems that high blood pressure will create. But along the way, one of the things that's definitely going to make a difference for is your risk for Alzheimer's <coughs> disease. Another one is exercise. And you'll notice that many of these things I'm mentioning are, as I said, generally good health recommendations, good for your heart. The optimal, optimal amount of aerobic exercise for an older person is about 150 minutes weekly. Now, many older people can't do that much. Uh, but it's also been shown that any amount of exercise lowers the risk. So getting up and getting out and going for a walk every day or something that you can tolerate and your doctor will permit you to do is a very important preventive step. I shouldn't say preventive, but one that will lower the risk of the disease. Nothing that I can tell you about will prevent Alzheimer's. But lowering the risk is uh, something that you can do with these things. And again, many other benefits come from regular exercise to your, to your general health, your emotional well-being, and so forth. This is something that if you're concerned about your health in general or Alzheimer's in particular, you very definitely should be uh, considering doing. Eating a balanced diet is another thing that uh, the World Health Organization says, and many other people do, uh, is a valuable thing for general health and well-being, uh, and particularly to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. There have been a number of studies that have shown that the so-called Mediterranean diet, and that's what's sort of pictured up here, as you can see, low-fat, fresh fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts and whole grains, uh, has been associated with a lower risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. One doesn't have to strict, stick absolutely rigidly to Mediterranean diet, but thinking about eating these kinds of foods on a regular basis and avoiding high fat foods, processed foods, and so forth will, again, not only help lower the risk of Alzheimer's, but help in other health uh, uh, areas as well. This one's obvious but it is one of the recommendations uh, that I want to mention. If you smoke, stop. If you don't smoke, don't start. Doesn't look like anybody here is at the point where they're likely to do that. It's clear that cigarette smokers have an increased number of, of many other, have an increased risk for many other diseases, including dementia, including Alzheimer's disease because of its effects on the vascular system, because of its effects on the brain through the toxic chemicals that are inhaled. For many reasons, cigarette smoking is bad for you in a, many different ways and is certainly something to be avoided uh, for lots of reasons, Alzheimer's being one of them. Drink in moderation or not at all. It used to be, you used to hear that, well, having a glass of wine or two is good, that'll help prevent dementia. There's not really great evidence for that, frankly, but it's probably not bad for you. But it is clear that binge drinking or uh, drink becoming an alcoholic and heavy drinking clearly increases the risk of Alzheimer's as well as many other dementias and obviously, again, other 
health and, and social con issues as well. Uh, again, one or two drinks. If you're not, if you're a teetotaler, don't start because you've heard that it's good for uh, preventing al uh, Alzheimer's. But if you like to have a drink or two, that's probably not going to harm you. Um, but it probably isn't going to do much good either. And uh, finally, staying socially and intellectually active. There have been a lot of studies that have looked at this. Some of them are uh, interesting and, and curious because some, again, hard to tell sometimes what's cause and effect. But it does seem that people who stay socially engaged and connected to others compared to people who are more socially isolated, people who are more connected have a lower risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. It's also the case that when you're on the way to develop Alzheimer's, you may become more socially isolated. So teasing out cause and effect is not always exactly easy to do. But clearly, there are few uh, risks to this and many benefits, again, beyond Alzheimer's, but to your general well-being, to remain connected to other people throughout your life, family, friends, maintaining socialization, an issue for many older people who become quite isolated. And it's something that we, as a society, need to address and something that individuals need to try to address as well. Staying intellectually active as well. And OSHA is a good example of that. Things that keep your mind going when you're older, helping you learn new things, keeping yourself engaged. Again, people may have heard, well, if I do the New York Times crossword puzzle, I won't get Alzheimer's. Unfortunately, that's not true. But if you do the New York Times crossword puzzle and you enjoy it, continue doing it. It won't stop it. Uh, it won't stop you from getting the disease. But doing things that engage your mind and that you enjoy, learning a new language, learning new things, reading books, staying intellectually alive, is something that's been associated in many studies with a lowered risk of developing Alzheimer's. And again, like all of these things I'm talking about, good for you in lots of other ways as well. So and there, are, there are other health things I could mention, avoiding diabetes, for example, and a variety of other things. Basically, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. And staying physically as healthy as you can is obviously a good thing to do, and it will lessen your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. What else can you do? Um, well, one of the things that I think is important is to plan. And one of the things I've been working on over the last year with a group from uh, Geisel Medical School, uh, Durham Medical School uh, uh, here, is to develop um, the Dartmouth Dementia Directive. We've been working on creating an advanced directive addendum, really, to your, to your advanced directive that deals with the concerns that are specific to Alzheimer's disease, and we call this the Dartmouth Dementia Directive. This is a, a shot of our website, the URL of which is on the bottom there. And uh, the, this is uh, what the first page of the directive looks like. You can see that there and read over it as general information. And then it goes on to offer various choices that people can, can elect. Uh, and then this whole form is attached to your advanced directive, or it be sits in, uh, lives individually, lives separately, and can be uh, scanned into the medical record here or elsewhere, or simply kept with your important papers. This is, as I said, designed to supplement, not replace a standard advanced directive. It's different, although there are some overlapping areas, but it's specifically designed to deal with what's What's unique about Alzheimer's disease or other dementias to, to some degree, but especially Alzheimer's, is the gradual nature of the loss. Many things that advanced directives deal with are such things that, well, today you're fine and tomorrow, you know, you have a coma or you have a stroke or you're hit by a car and you're out of touch completely. With Alzheimer's disease, that's a gradual process, as I mentioned, over many years. And people may elect 
different choices, different things that they would want for their care if they're in the earlier stages of disease, whereas if they're in the later stages of the disease, they may elect something else. Someone may want, if they're in the earlier stages of disease, to be treated with antibiotics, to go to the hospital if need be, and so forth, whereas somebody, in, if they uh, were in the later stages of the disease, may choose not to have that, not to go to the hospital, not to have antibiotics or other things, but just merely to be kept comfortable. Our directive deals with that and allows people to make a choice based on how far along the disease might be. Although there's not something you complete when you have dementia, it's something you complete anticipating whether or not you will get it. And it's, we like to think of it as an umbrella. Take it along with you, hope you don't need it. This is one of the pages from the form, and we divide it up according to types of options for medical care, options for nutrition and fluids that you might get, and where you'd like to be cared for, location of care. As I mentioned, do you want to go to the hospital? Do you want to be in a hospice? Do you want to stay at home? And this page uh, is the same for uh, the section on mild dementia, for the section on moderate dementia, and on severe dementia, and you can make different choices accordingly. And the form itself gives some guidance as to, well, what is mild dementia or severe dementia? And there's more information about that on our website as well. So we've been encouraging people to certainly complete a standard advanced directive. If you don't have that, you certainly should. And then to consider adding on this dementia-specific uh, supplement to it. One of the things we're doing as well in this uh, project is we are offering people the option to video record their uh, Dartmouth Dementia Directive. So you may check off all these boxes and put the papers uh, wherever you're going to file them, but we're offering you the option also to make a short, up to 10 minute video talking about your wishes for care should you develop dementia, maybe reading through the things you've listed or elaborating on those. And if people are interested, there's a page on our website that you can click that has information about that. And if people are interested in that, we have a team that will come and visit you in your home, if you don't live too far away, uh, make the video, and uh, if it goes well, give it to you on a thumb drive. It's yours. We don't keep a copy of it. This is your, your directive. You copy it if you want on your computer. You give it to your doctor, to your family, whatever. It's an added... Uh, uh, supplement to the directive itself, which is, you know, a cold piece of paper. Some people feel that their family, their doctor, or their durable power of attorney would appreciate this more personal expression of someone's wishes in addition to the written directive. And there's some evidence, not, it's not been something that's been studied a great deal, but there's some evidence in literature that suggests that people who record their wishes on video, in addition to putting them down on paper, that there's a higher chance of it being followed. It's all well and good to complete an advanced directive, but uh, the unfortunate fact is sometimes they aren't followed. The doctors are supposed to follow them. It's not the law. You can't be, you can't, it's not illegal not to follow it. You're supposed to, and there are many cases we all, all have heard about where somebody said, I don't want this, I don't want that, and they get sick, and they get that and this. There's some chance, uh, there's some uh, evidence to suggest that not only indicating what you want on paper, but also putting in a video that your family, your physician, hopefully, and your durable power of attorney has uh, viewed, that this will increase the chances that your wishes will be honored. If you're interested in doing this, you should first fill out the form, and as I said, the website, you can download the, the Dementia Directive um, uh, online from our website. It's the latest version. We've changed it many times, and, but the latest version is always on the website. And then contact us, and there's an email address here which you can see, and that's also in your handout. This doesn't cost anything, by the way. We're doing this as a, we're interested to see if it makes a difference and how feasible it is to, to actually do this. And so if you want to do it, we're happy to do it, um, and it, it, it won't cost you anything. Filling out an advanced directive under any circumstances does not cost anything. Filling out ours doesn't cost anything, and doing the video doesn't either. 
So I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to take questions. We have lots of time for them, uh, if people have them. And uh, let me know what, what concerns you. Yes, sir. Would you comment on the um, sleep and the progression of uh, any of the, these spectrum diseases of dementia, either too little sleep or too much sleep? Okay. And, and any remedial action that you can take if, if you're in one direction or the other? Uh, it's a good question, the que and I'll just repeat it in case anybody, people didn't hear it. Uh, the question has to do with what about sleep and Alzheimer's or other dementias? And in, there are a few things I can say about that. One is uh, it's very, very common to have abnormal sleep with Alzheimer's disease, and that is often, and particularly early on, impaired sleep, not having the ability to sleep, waking up during the night and wandering around for a long period of time. Not to say that older, older, older people typically wake up multiple times during the night, but with Alzheimer's it tends to be worse and tends to be more disruptive. Often people with Alzheimer's wake up in the middle of the night and don't realize it's the middle of the night, think it's time to get up. Um, that is a common symptom and it's particularly worrisome if the person is has a fair amount of dementia, is living at home, thinks it's morning and goes out to buy the newspaper or go to work because they think they're still working and it's three o'clock in the morning and that's, that's a very real concern that, that uh, comes up and is sometimes a reason why people end up getting placed in a long-term care setting because of the risk of somebody wandering off in the middle of the night. So that's one, one area that's of concern. Um, Another area is, another thing that I would say though is that for many people with Alzheimer's disease, the opposite problem or the opposite uh, uh, issue, situation occurs, namely that people tend to sleep a great deal. They may sleep 20 hours a day, a uh, long time at night, lots of naps during the day, seems like they're always sleeping. And Families can sometimes be bothered by that, particularly if it's somebody who didn't ever used to like to nap or used to be more active, but is now just you know go, sleeping all the time, falling asleep in the chair or on the couch. Um, that seems to be part of the disease and why it happens. I don't know that that can be easily explained, but we know that it does happen. Um, it can becomes a concern if somebody sleeps a great deal late in the day if it becomes disruptive to their sleep at night. And that might be the only time where it would be justified to kind of get somebody up if they're sleeping late afternoon or certainly after dinner, but early, still early, to wake them up so they stay awake for a little while before the usual time to go to bed to ensure a full night's sleep. Uh, there are a variety of medicines that are available, but none of them are very good, whether you have Alzheimer's or not. None of them are very effective for sleep and all come with a bunch of side effects. And that is particularly the case for people who have dementia. People who have dementia, uh, there are very few medicines that are uh, good uh, and safe to use to help keep someone asleep or get somebody to sleep. Um, I'm not going to make specific recommendations about that. I'm actually no longer in practice. It's been a number of years. Uh, but in general, I can say that as a f uh, that it's something that's uh, problematic. And the best ways to deal with that if somebody has trouble sleeping at night is for them to be have some awake time and activity during the day, get outside at least for part of the time during the day, as long as the weather's tolerable, um, that those things will be, are associated with a greater likelihood of sleeping through the night. But it's a very serious issue for many people and a very, very common one. Yes. <coughs> Is there a value to a more comprehensive neuropsych test as opposed to the mini mental status? The, the question is, is there a, a value to having more comprehensive neuropsychological testing as opposed to a short test like the mini mental or some of the other very short tests, the MOCA and so forth, that are used in the doctor's office? And the answer is sometimes. 
but it isn't automatic, although many places will automatically order a full battery of neuropsychological testing. When it comes in handy, when it's most uh, useful, is when there's a, a great deal of difficulty understanding, knowing what's going on. And neuropsychological testing, especially in somebody who's quite bright and well-educated, neuropsychological testing may be one good way of picking up some early changes that aren't easily picked up on the briefer uh, screens than the doctor's office. Um, but I, it, and when I was in practice, it is something that I would order occasionally, neuropsych testing for cases like that, or to track someone's progress over time, but not as a, not as a routine. It isn't something I don't feel is absolutely essential in every case to to make a diagnosis or to treat to follow somebody with Alzheimer's disease. Yes, Steve. Um, I'd like to do an ad advertisement. We have a terrific resource locally, and that's the Aging Resource Center. Um, Dartmouth Hitchcock sponsors a good amount of it. I love it. Um, and also, a more focused advertisement. There's a group of us, a handful of us, are, have begun this organization, but we're in the early stages of it. It's a group of those with early stage. Alzheimer's or other impairing diseases. And um, we're just a handful of group, I mean a handful of people, but yeah, we're in our early stages in dealing with our understanding. And an important thing too is we are the people who are suffering or experiencing the disease. We aren't the caregivers. There's a lot of support for the caregivers, and God knows. They need the support. But especially in the early stage, I do believe there's a lot of value in also at least getting us together. I think that's, you raise very, very good points, and I'll just address them to underline what you said, if I may. First of all, you mentioned the Aging Resource Center, which is located across the street over in Centera Park. It is run by Dartmouth Hitchcock and they offer a wide range of services that are very valuable, including support groups for caregivers, and uh, I'm not sure if your group is under the auspices of the Aging Resource Center or not, but support groups are invaluable. For most of the support groups that exist are for caregivers, for people who are taking care of someone, who are attached to someone with Alzheimer's disease, and it's an enormously beneficial opportunity for people to get together and talk about what they're going through and to realize they're not alone. It's a tremendously valuable thing. Uh, in addition to that, and separate from that, is the type of early stage group that you're talking about where people who have mild dementia, mild Alzheimer's disease, can get together and talk among themselves with or without some sort of uh, uh, facilitator about the challenges of, uh, uh, of dealing with these conditions. And that's an enormously valuable thing as well. In many places that are more populated around the country than the Upper Valley here, those exist routinely. It's uh, good to know that one is going and that it's been on and off again a few, uh, over the last few years at the Aging Resource Center, not because anyone thought it wasn't a good idea, but simply because even though it is a very good idea, there are many people who don't want to do it and should. So I'm glad you brought that up and I, I uh, think the, you know, I mentioned the cost of Alzheimer's disease before, uh, which is enormous, the thing, support groups are free. It's the biggest bargain there is in this field. Place to get in touch with us. Okay. In this group. Mm -hmm. They they are located right across the street. They have a website. You can get a, to connect to them if you uh, want. You can call the main hospital number and they can transfer you over there. So, yes. I have a related question. Uh, can you cite uh, centers of excellence in the United States and outside uh, on the brain science research? Not simply uh, related to uh, this problem, but including this problem. Do you, are, 
is the question, what are some of the best places for uh, Alzheimer's care or, or research? Research in the brain and yeah. in the okay. uh, Well, I can speak about Alzheimer's because I know that the best, uh, and but that may well apply uh, uh, to more broadly. Some of the best places are the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Mass General uh, down in Boston, Columbia in New York, Johns Hopkins, all of these places are doing tremendously important research. The Banner Institute out in Arizona. There are many, many places that have interesting and important things going on. Internationally, uh, uh, internationally I'm less able to uh, give you uh, examples of places, but uh, there are certainly good centers in France and in Germany that I know of. I'm less sure about other places. Um, uh, but. You know, without sounding too parochial, some of the best medical care available and research is right here in the United States. Yes? Um, does the Honor and Care Decisions Office here know about your... Oh, yes. They, they do. The I went to our training not too long ago, but it wasn't... It's, it's quite new. Our work is quite new, and we I just actually was on the, uh, in conversation with them just within a few weeks yeah. ago uh, to uh, make sure they're aware of it. They're in, very interested in including this as part of what they do. The, this is the honoring care decisions component of the medical center run through the, the uh, social services department or patient and family services department here at Hitchcock. Um, so they are aware, and inc we hope increasingly so. But one of you know, we we spent a long time working on this over the last year. Our job this year is to disseminate it, get so people are aware of it. That's part of what I meant, why I'm mentioning it here. Uh, but we want to get the word out as as widely as possible. Yes. You mentioned six common sense practices to help restore the development of Alzheimer's. Once you can diagnose with Alzheimer's, is there any evidence? Practices while certainly beneficial to good health. Does anything to do with stop the progression? That's a good question. The, the question is uh, aside from those uh, six things that I mentioned to help lessen the risk of developing the disease, once someone has the disease, do they, do they help at all? And that's less clear, more controversial. But there does seem to be evidence that, uh, for example, exercise is good once you have early onset, or, or not early onset, excuse me, early Alzheimer's disease, uh, and maybe even later on, uh, to help maintain, to maybe slow the progression of the disease somewhat, uh, not to mention the other uh, benefits, such as the social engagement that's often involved and the general uh, uh, benefits to health that come with that. Diet, less clear about, although anything you do once you have Alzheimer's that makes you more likely to get sick is bad for the, is going to make your Alzheimer's worse. Having Alzheimer's and then getting sick with almost anything, even something as trivial as a, uh, as a flu, for example, or a broken bone. I say trivial meaning not life-threatening. Flu can be life-threatening, of course, but something I'm talking about common. Even those conditions can make the disease considerably worse. Certainly a heart attack or a stroke will make Alzheimer's disease worse, and those are things that may be, the risk of those may be lessened by some of these uh, bits of advice I've given, given. As far as saying connected with others, there's no doubt that it helps people emotionally and uh, to remain engaged. And we have a variety of activities that have been created around the Upper Valley for people with Alzheimer's disease, some of which are uh, sponsored through Dartmouth, some of which are sponsored through the Aging Resource Center for people who have early, uh, early stage disease or moderate stage disease to keep people engaged and involved with others because we know that that benefits them and their, and their care partners enormously. As far as staying engaged intellectually, uh, that becomes more tricky because once someone has Alzheimer's disease, it may, may not be something that they can do to take a course or learn a foreign language, something like that. Those may become exercises in frustration. But to whatever extent one is able to remain intellectually engaged, cognitively engaged, is probably beneficial. Yes. 
Reticens protocol, he wrote a book called uh, Preventing and Reversing Alzheimer's. Yes, yeah, so I've read about it. I've read about it. I've heard of him. Um, in general, I would say anything that sounds too good to be true, maybe it's too good to be true. Um, that isn't to say that a lot of his advice isn't good standard advice for helping lessen the risk of developing the disease. But as I was saying to this gentleman before, once you have Alzheimer's disease, things change a little bit. And it's not clear to me that dietary changes are going to uh, make it possible for people to reverse uh, the disease or eliminate the disease or anything else for that matter. I wish that that were the case but I'm not sure that it is. But some of the advice in general for general health and well-being is, is perfectly fine. Yes? You haven't um, discussed any of the genetic, the DNA evidence. And for those of us who come from families where we've lost siblings and parents with Alzheimer's, um, I guess the question more comes, we understand that our risks are way up there when we have that. But who do you see? Neurologists, psychiatrists, your PCP knows nothing. I mean, they say to you, oh yeah, you should choose who you should see. What kind of doctors do you go to? The, the, what kind of doctor? You should go to a doctor who knows, what, who knows about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's a good question. He's it's not, a, well, he's not practicing it. Um, the, it's a, it's a, a couple aspects of your question. I'll come to the genetics in a moment, which I didn't talk about, thought about talking about, but I left out. Um, but as far as who you see, again, I, I don't mean to sound, uh, to make, make light of it, it's less important whether you see a neurologist, a geriatrician who's an internist who specializes in geriatric care, a geriatric psychiatrist. Um, the, the particular label is less crucial then, as I say, seeing someone who is interested and has knowledge about the disease. Um, now, by, in many places, it is neurologists who are most likely to treat this, although not ex exclusively, or no, most likely to diagnose Alzheimer's disease, although that's not exclusively the case. And there's no reason why a good geriatrician or geriatric psychiatrist or other type of doctor who uh, can't can't manage it as well. Um, but the key thing is finding someone who knows about it. What I would do if, you know, in the case of coming here would be to contact, uh, to first of all ask a for a recommendation from your primary care doctor who might have more uh, insight into this or uh, uh, inside knowledge. Um, or to contact the medical center, Department of Neurology uh, here, for example, would be a good start, or the geriatric clinic here in the Department of Internal Medicine would be a good place. There is a geriatrician who's now running a memory clinic in internal medicine, uh, uh, Dan Sadler, and that would be a place to go. There are people in neurology like Ali Stark, Ale Dr. Alexander Stark, who's very good at this and very knowledgeable. Um, so you have to pick and choose, but again, finding somebody who knows about it, because simply being a geriatric psychiatrist, let's say, doesn't automatically mean that you're an expert in Alzheimer's disease. You might be, but, but you might not be. Could I ask a question about the money? Can we get back to the yeah. genetics? Let, uh, let me finish this question first, if I may, yeah. Um, the, the other part of your question was, uh, uh, had to do with the genetics. and. It is the case that Alzheimer's disease runs in families. If you have a parent or a sibling, a direct blood, a first degree blood relative with the disease, statistically your chances uh, go up uh, by two to three times, two and a half times the likelihood of your getting the disease. That still isn't an, an inevitability by any means. If you have more close relatives with the disease, you may have a higher risk, though the numbers are a little hard to work out exactly in terms of the percentages. But it's also important to realize that you can have relatives with the disease and not get, the, not get Alzheimer's, but that the many people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's have no relatives with the disease, so it is not totally genetic. Genes are a risk factor. The one gene we know the most about is called the apolipoprotein 
E gene that comes in several different varieties. And if you happen to have the E4 allele of that gene, one or two copies, because you get one from each parent, uh, that increases your risk of the disease. Not to 100%, but it does considerably increase the risk. So at the current state of knowledge that we have, the best thing to say is that if this is something that's in your family, first of all, you're much more aware of it because it's in the family. Secondly, there may be a genetic risk, a higher genetic, excuse me, higher genetic risk for you. Simply stay aware. Don't assume that it's an inevitability, but stay aware and keep in touch with your doctor about it. Now, the other, you had a question? Yeah, I did. Um, given the monumental cost responsibilities we, if we have the disease, have when we're aware of it, make plans that might result in our family or the society not spending huge amounts of money at a time when I'm really not in good shape. Well, those are, you know, it's a very, very good question. The question is how Given the co enormous cost of this disease, and I showed you those figures early, earlier, what responsibilities do people have to, to try to address that? Um, and different people have different attitudes about that. There are some people who feel, based on their own personality or their religious beliefs or whatever, that you know, it's God's decision for me to live as long as I'm going to live, and that's what I want to do, and I'm still enjoying my life, and I'm going to keep going as long as I want. Other people want to short circuit the process for themselves and for their families. One of the things that our directive will allow is for people to make choices along those lines. There certainly are no laws in this country that allow uh, euthanasia or uh, there are no laws in any state that allow physician assisted suicide in the case of dementia. And there probably never will be, but I Hard to know what the future holds, but uh, physician-assisted assisted, uh, physician suicide is legal in about eight states, nine states, but uh, people have to be in good mental health to be able to choose that, and that is not the case, obviously, in somebody with dementia. So that is one of the reasons to focus on preparing for the future and considering these questions in making your advanced directives. Um, the, the risk of it is that, I mean, one can argue, well, this is a very expensive disease, and taking care of old people is expensive anyway, and there are people who argue, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be spending money on them. That's ageism. <laughs> that's ageism. And that's not the way we, you know, the measure of our society is how well do we do taking care of our most in need, I think. Um, but these are individual decisions, tough ethical decisions that need to be made, and Everyone has a right to, to make their own decision. But obviously, you have to address these things before you get dementia, because once you have dementia, you're not going to be able to think about it in the same way. Yes, sir? I want to second the appeal for people that have early onset Alzheimer's to get in touch with uh, any of the groups in the Upper Valley that could get them in touch with groups such as the man <coughs> spoke up down here about, because there are very few. There are very few. Groups where early Alzheimer people can get together and talk over their problems, and that would be so helpful. For them. It's and, and like you said, they're either maybe don't feel good about or easy about doing that. Um, I would say go ahead, go ahead and do it. Secondly, I just had a question about you. Any of the early medications that are being used, such as Zeprazil, are any of them the cause of extremely harmful? nightmarish dreams that rob people of sleep that need to have that sleep for yeah. all of it's a, it's a good question. Uh, two things that you talked about. One is about the value of support groups, and I couldn't agree more with you about that and about the group that Steve here talked about uh, for <coughs> excuse me, people with early stage disease. Uh, I, I wish more people would go. I wish there were more <coughs> groups. Again, in this rural area like ours, they're few and far between. If you go to Boston or New York, they're much more common now, but uh, they're enormously valuable and people should take advantage of it. As far as the question about the dreams and medications, one of the common side effects, unfortunately, for denepazil and some of the other 
medications, the cholinesterase inhibitors, can be nightmares, severe nightmares, which are horrendous for people. And it's a reason why people will stop or maybe sometimes should stop the medication. Um, there are sometimes ways around that in terms of the timing of the medicine, the timing, the time the medicine is given or switching to a related medicine that may not have as a likely chance of causing that. But it is a very real thing. Nightmares are a known side effect of this group of medication. Not everybody gets them. I don't know what percentage, frankly. It's, I'm sure somebody knows, but I don't know. It's not a small percentage. It does happen. And it's something that one should warn one's patients and families about. Because if it does happen, it could well be the medicine, not just, you know, things are falling apart in my head, so I'm getting nightmares. It may well be the medicine and needs to be dealt with that way. Other questions? Yes, sir. Family member has a father or brother Alzheimer's disease. Could you get it or not? And then, if you carry gene A, B, O, E, four, there's a more probability of that. Yes. They didn't mention anything. Yes. Right. Well, you're you're absolutely right on both counts. If you have a parent or a sibling with the disease, you do have an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's. Uh, two and a half times uh, on average is uh, what the risk is. And that risk probably in most cases is associated with the presence of an E4 allele on the apple lipoprotein E gene. Those, uh, those are uh, probably the most common reasons for the familial connection in the disease. In early onset Alzheimer's, there are other genes that are involved, but again, those are very, very rare. But in the t typical garden variety of Alzheimer's, the alpha lipoprotein E4 gene is the one that is most likely the cause. Yes? Where can you get the APOE4 test done here locally? I've called this hospital and never got out of the phone. Um, no matter what you call about, that's really likely to happen when you call the hospital, <laughs> I've discovered. Um, and I used to work here, but that's you know, so. <clears throat> Actually, in all the years that I was in practice here, uh, I would never order the apple lipoprotein for test. We would use it in research, but never order it. Why? Because it's a risk factor. If you have it, it may mean you have a higher chance of getting the disease, but it doesn't mean you're going to get it. And likewise, if you don't have the E4, you can still get Alzheimer's disease. So clinicians generally recommend against it, and the medical groups typically recommend against it. Now that there are commercial firms like 20, 23andMe and uh, whatever, who are offering genetic testing, you can just go online and order it up. Um, what you do with the information, though, is important. And realize that if you order, if you find out that you are APOE4 positive, in other words, you have it. One or two copies. Yes, you can have one from a mother or one from a father, or you can be unlucky enough to have from both. That certainly increases your risk of the disease. You don't want your insurance company to find that out <laughs> because there have been cases where insurance has been withheld. Long-term care insurance, even life insurance, have been withheld from people who have that. It's illegal, but they find ways to do it. So there are, I'm not saying that one shouldn't, and there are people who feel firmly, they want to know what their risk is. They want to be tested. And what I would encourage people to do is to simply get, go and do that on their own. I wouldn't order the test. Do you know who does that here? I don't know anybody who does it here. You have to go into 23andMe. There may be people who do it, but again, I haven't been in practice here for four years, so I can't tell you. Okay, thank you. Yes. I believe you said earlier that there is no reliable clinical test for Alzheimer's. Is there much of a problem with false diagnoses either way? Good, that's a good question. Is there a pro the question is, since there's no definitive test for Alzheimer's, is there 
a problem with false diagnosis, false positives, and false negatives, people being told they have Alzheimer's when they don't, and people and the diagnosis being missed. And the answer is yes, it happens in both directions. We try to minimize that. But I can think back in my own practice where people who I have told had Alzheimer's, hopefully not very many, and I can only think of one case right now, where I told somebody they had Alzheimer's, and I kept seeing them for years, and they didn't have Alzheimer's. Um, that's, always, that's the good outcome. Does it get missed? It gets missed a lot. Uh, there are the numbers that I gave, the statistics, 5.8 million people now, those aren't diagnosed people. Those are just estimated amounts. The fact is the va a great percentage of people who have Alzheimer's are not diagnosed. Their doctors don't pick it up. They don't go to the doctor. They don't tell the doctor the symptoms they're having, and it doesn't get diagnosed, which is a shame, because if you're unlucky enough to have it, you ought to know about it, and your doctor ought to know about it, and you ought to start preparing for it in whatever ways there are. That will become particularly important when we have better treatments, but it's important even today. So the false diagnosis can happen in either direction, false positives, false negatives. We really need a reliable test to tell us, and we don't have that. I hope we will in a few years, but we don't have it now. Yes. What is the threshold entrance for hospice? Say that again. What is the threshold entrance for hospice? Oh, oh, what is the threshold uh, for uh, acceptance in, in the hospice program for with Alzheimer's disease? Uh, it, it's a good question, and I'll uh, preface it by saying if your Alzheimer's or your loved one's Alzheimer's progressed significantly, hospice is a very, very valuable aid in coping with the disease and caring for someone with the disease. Medicare offers a hospice benefit and there are criteria to, uh, to be eligible for that. Hospice was originally started for uh, cancer patients and other patients with terminal conditions that are people where people are, you know, you can kind of predict exactly when someone is going to die. It's very hard to predict when someone with Alzheimer's, even late stage Alzheimer's, is going to die. But the criteria are that someone needs to be in the latest stage of the disease, what's so-called stage seven in the disease. And that means that they are really unable to do any activities on their own. They need assistance with everything. They aren't able to speak more than six words, or they have six words or fewer that they can speak. Usually when, when that's the case, mo most of those six are curse words in my experience. Um, uh, and there are uh, people, but there are other criteria that you have to have had or, or you, you may have had a life-threatening condition such as an episode of pneumonia within a certain number of months before. I'm a little more vague about what the details of that are. But by and large, it's that you have to be in the very latest stages of the disease. Unlike with other uh, conditions, you don't have to, the doctor doesn't have to say, that you're likely to die within six months, which is the criteria for most conditions that uh, hospice uh, necessitates, because that can't be predicted, but you have to be in those late stages. It's certainly worth exploring, because the benefits that hospice offers in terms of the support to the individual, management of difficult symptoms, and support for up to six months after to the spouse or the family after the death of the individual is enormous. And there's no other insurance that, once, you know, once you die, your insurance, you're done. Hospice will, will provide support to the care partner for up to six months, you know, visits, how you're doing, and so forth, whatever is needed. Tremendously valuable thing. Hospice is very worthwhile. Hospice can occur in something like the Jack Burns Center here, which recently opened up. It's a separate building here in the Medical Center campus. Hospice uh, services can be provided in nursing homes, and hospice can be provided and often is provided in the home setting itself. So it's a very, you don't have to go into a building to get hospice services, although that is an option, um, uh, but it's a very worthwhile thing to take advantage of for people who are unfortunate enough to be in the later stages of the disease. <coughs> Any other questions? <coughs> yes. Yeah, 
it's interesting. There are the uh, turmeric is what is found in curry, or it's what is added to curry. I don't know, added or it's part of curry. It's a, it's a spice, and there have been. Uh, it is true. It's it's being studied now to see if it's associated with a lower risk of Alzheimer's, because uh, of the reality that Alzheimer's is less frequent in India. Now, some of that is because we don't live as long in India, but some of it may have to, and some of it may be genetic, uh, but it, some of it may well have to do with diet. We don't know enough. I mean, as I said earlier, we don't know what caused this disease. So I would not want to say categorically, well, diet things don't matter. They, pro they may well, and they certainly aren't going to hurt. Um, so uh, it's, to my knowledge, the turmeric study is still, curcumin is another word for it, I believe that is still ongoing and the results aren't in, but people do uh, swear by it and I don't see any harm in that. But I, at the same time I can't say, yeah, this is worth doing. We just simply don't know. And that would be true for a whole variety of things that are out there like this. Other, yes? It, it is one of, the, you're right, that it is one of the theories that's talked about. It's di people sometimes refer to Alzheimer's as diabetes type 3. There's type 1, which is early onset insulin dependent diabetes type 2, which is the more common thing that older individuals get that may or may not require insulin. And some people are going diabetes type 3, Alzheimer's diabetes type 3. And it is true that the brain's ability to, the brain utilizes sugar as energy. And without that, without a lot of energy, because the brain is so uh, in, in need of energy to, to function, uh, the, the brain would be damaged by that. And there is some uh, investigation looking into the role of uh, anti-diabetes medications, diabetic uh, medications, including insulin, uh, for treating the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Now, there was a study that was done of intranasal insulin, uh, insulin sprayed into the nose, uh, feeling that, well, I'll go right to the brain because it's so close. That actually didn't, that, that study recently, uh, I believe, was concluded and the results have not been positive. But there are other diabetes uh, drugs that are being looked at and showing some uh, possible effects, but it's uh, too early to say definitively that it makes a difference. It is one of the many theories that is out there, and as I said, there are, there are lots of theories, but unfortunately we still don't know.